Today we're going to start the last chapter of the Jungle Book, and it starts on page 190. The name of the chapter is called Her Majesty's Servants. You can work it out by fractions or by simple rule of three, but the way of twiddledum is not the way of twiddledee. You can twist it, you could turn it, you can plate it till you drop, but the way of Pilly Winkies, not the way of Winky Pop. It had been raining heavily for one whole month, raining in a camp of 30,000 men, thousands of camels, elephants, horses, bullocks, and mules, all gathered together at a place called Rawal Pindi to be reviewed by the Viceroy of India. He was receiving a visit from the Emir of Afghanistan a wild king of a very wild country. And the emir had brought with him for a bodyguard 800 men and horses who had never seen a camp or a locomotive before in their lives. Savage men and savage horses from somewhere at the back of Central Asia. Every night, a mob of these horses would be sure to break their heel ropes and stampede up and down the camp through the mud in the dark. Or the camels would break loose and run about and fall over the roofs of the tents. And you can imagine how pleasant that was for men trying to go to sleep. My tent lay far away from the camel lines and I thought it was safe. But one night, a man popped his head in and shouted, Get out, quick! They're coming! My tent's gone! I knew who they were. So I put on my boots and waterproof and scuttled out into the slush. Little Vixen, my fox terrier, went out through the other side. And then there was a roaring and a grunting and bubbling. And I saw the tent cave in as a pole snapped and began to dance about like a mad ghost. A camel had blundered into it. And what an angry as I was, I could not help laughing. And then I ran on because I did not know how many camels might have got loose. And before long, I was out of sight of the camp, plowing my way through the mud. At last I fell over the tail end of a gun, and by that knew I was somewhere near the artillery lines, where the cannon were stacked at night. And I did not want to plowder about any more in the drizzle in the dark. I put my waterproof over the muzzle of one gun, and made a sort of wigwam with two or three rammers that I found, and lay along the tail of another gun, wondering where Vixen had got to and where I might be. Just as I was getting ready to sleep, I heard a jingle of harness and a grunt, and a mule passed me, shaking his wet ears. He belonged to a screw gun battery, for I could hear the rattle of the straps and rings and chains and things on his saddle pad. The screw guns are tiny little cannon made in two pieces that are screwed together when the time comes to use them. They are taken up mountains, anywhere that a mule can find a road, and they are very useful for fighting in a rocky country. Behind the mule, there was a camel with his big soft feet squelching and slipping in the mud and his neck bobbing to and fro like a strayed hen's. Luckily, I knew enough of beast language, not wild beast language, but camp beast language, of course, from the natives to know what he was saying. He must have been the one that flopped into my tent, for he called to the mule, What shall I do? Where shall I go? I have fought with a white thing that waved, and it took a stick and hit me on the neck. That was my broken tent pole, and I was very glad to know it. Shall we run on? Ah, it was you, said the mule, you and your friends that have been disturbing the camp. All right, you'll be beaten for this in the morning, but I may, may as well give you something on account now. I heard the harness jingle as the mule backed and caught the camel two kicks in the ribs that rang like a drum. Another time, he said, you'll know better than to run through a mule battery at night shouting, thieves and fire. Sit down and keep your silly neck quiet. The camel doubled up camel fashion, like a two-foot rule, and sat down whimpering. There was a regular beat of hoofs in the distance, in the darkness, and a big troop horse cantered up as steadily as though he were on parade. 
jumped a gun tail and landed close to the mule. It's disgraceful, he said, blowing out his nostrils. Those camels have racketed through our lines again, the third time this week. How's a horse to keep his condition if he isn't allowed to sleep? Who's here? I'm the breech piece mule of number two gun of the first screw battery, said the mule, and the other's one of your friends. He's waked me up too. Who are you? Number 15, E Troop, Ninth Lancers, Dick Cunliffe's horse. Stand over a little there. Oh, beg your pardon, said the mule. It's too dark to see much. Aren't those camels too sickening for anything? I walked out of my lines to get a little peace and quiet here. My lords, said the camel humbly, we dreamed bad dreams in the night, and we were very much afraid. I am only a baggage camel of the 39th Native Infantry, and I am not so brave as you are, my lords. Then why the pickets didn't you stay and carry baggage for the 39th Native Infantry, instead of running all around the camp, said the mule. They were such very bad dreams, said the camel. I am sorry. Listen, what is that? Shall we run on again? Sit down, said the mule, or you'll snap your long legs between the guns. He cocked one ear and listened. Bullocks, he said, gun bullocks. On my word, you and your friends have waked the camp very thoroughly. It takes a good deal of prodding to put up a gun bullock. I heard a chain dragging along the ground, and a yoke of the great silky white bullocks that drag the heavy siege guns when the elephants won't go any nearer to the firing, came shouldering along together, and almost stepping on the chain was another battery mule calling wildly for Billy. That's one of our recruits, said the old mule to the troop horse. He's calling for me. Here, youngster, stop, st stop squealing. The dark never hurt anybody yet. The gun bullocks lay down together and began chewing the cud, but the young mule huddled close to Billy. Things, he said, fearful and horrible things, Billy. They came into our lines while we were asleep. Do you think they'll kill us? I've a great mind to give you a number one kicking, said Billy. The idea of a 14-hand mule with your training disgracing the battery before this gentleman? Gently, gently, said the troop horse. Remember, they are always like this to begin with. The first time I ever saw a man, it was in Australia when I was three years old. I ran for half a day. And if I'd seen a camel, I should have been running still. Nearly all our horses for the English cavalry are brought to India from Australia and are broken in by the troopers themselves. True enough, said Billy. Stop shaking, youngster. The first time they put the full harness with all its chains on my back, I stood on my forelegs and kicked every bit of it off. I hadn't learned the real signs of kicking then, but the battery said they had never seen anything like it. But this wasn't harness or anything that jingled, said the young mule. You know I don't mind that now, Billy. It was things like trees, and they fell up and down the lines and bubbled, and my head rope broke, and I couldn't find my driver, and I couldn't find you, Billy. So I ran off with, with these gentlemen. Hmm said Billy. As soon as I heard the camels were loose, I came away on my own account quietly. When a battery, a screw gun mule calls gun bullocks gentlemen, he must be very badly shaken up. Who are you fellows on the ground there? The gun bullocks rolled their cuds and answered both together. The seventh yoke of the first gun of the big gun battery. We were asleep when the camels came, but when we were trampled on, we got up and walked away. It is better to lie quiet in the mud than to be disturbed on good bedding. We told your friend here that there was nothing to be afraid of, but he knew so much that he thought otherwise. Wah! They went on chewing. That comes of being afraid, said Billy. You get laughed at by gun bullocks. I hope you like it, young'un. The young mule's teeth snapped 
and I heard him say something about not being afraid of any beefy old bullocks in the world. But the bullocks only clicked their horns together and went on chewing. Now, don't be angry after you've been afraid. That's the worst kind of cowardice, said the troop horse. Anybody can be forgiven for being scared in the night, I think, if they see things they don't understand. We've broken out of our pickets again and again, 450 of us. Just because a new recruit got to telling tales of whip snakes at home in Australia, till we were scared to death of the loose ends of our head ropes. That's all very well in camp, said Billy. I'm not above stampeding myself for the fun of the thing when I haven't been out for a day or two. But what do you do on active service? Oh, that's quite another set of new shoes, said the troop horse. Dick Cunliffe's on my back then and drives his knees into me and all I have to do is watch where I am putting my feet and to keep my hind legs well under me. And be bridle wise. What's bridle wise? said the young mule. By the blue gums of the back blocks, snorted the truth troop horse. Do you mean to say that you aren't taught to be bridle wise in your business? How can you do anything? unless you can spin round at once when the rain is pressed on your neck. It means life or death to your man. And of course, that's life or death to you. Get round with your hind legs under you the instant you feel the rain on your neck. If you haven't room to swing round, rear up a little and come round on your hind legs. That's being bridle-wise. We aren't taught that way, said Billy the Mule stiffly. We're taught to obey the man at our head. Step off when he says so, and step in when he says so. I suppose it comes to the same thing. Now with all this fine fancy business and rearing, which must be very bad for your hawks, what do you do? That depends, said the troop horse. Generally I have to go in among a lot of yelling, hairy men with knives. Long, shiny knives. Worse than the farrier's knives. And I have to take care that Dick's boot is just touching the next man's boot without crushing him. I can see Dick's lance to the right of my right eye, and I know I am safe. I shouldn't care to be the man or horse that stood up to Dick and me when we're in a hurry. Don't the knives hurt, said the young mule. Well, I got one cut across the chest once, but that wasn't Dick's fault. A lot I should have cared whose fault it was, if it hurt, said the young mule. You must, said the troop horse. If you don't trust your man, you may as well run away at once. That's what some of our horses do, and I don't blame them. As I was saying, it wasn't Dick's fault. The man was lying on the ground, and I stretched myself not to tread on him, and he slashed up at me. Next time I have to go over a man lying down, I shall step on him. Hard. Hmm, said Billy. Sounds very foolish. Knives are dirty things at any time. The proper thing to do is to climb up a mountain with a well-balanced saddle. Hang on by all four feet and your ears too and creep and crawl and wriggle along till you come out hundreds of feet above anyone else on a ledge where there's just room enough for your hoofs. Then you stand still and keep quiet. Never ask a man to hold your head, young'un. Keep quiet while the guns are being put together, and then you watch the little poppy shells drop down into the treetops ever so far below. Don't you ever trip, said the troop horse. They say that when a mule trips, you can split a hen's ear, said Billy. Now and again, perhaps, a badly packed saddle will upset a mule, but it's very seldom. I wish I could show you our business. It's beautiful. What? It took me three years to find out what the man were driving at. The science of the thing is never to show up against the skyline, because if you do, you may get fired at. Remember that, youngin. Always keep hidden as much as possible, even if you have to go a mile out of your way. I lead the battery when it comes to that sort of climbing. Fired at without the chance of running into the people who are firing, 
said the troop horse, thinking hard. I couldn't stand that. I should want to charge with Dick. Oh, no, you wouldn't. You know, you know that as soon as the guns are in position, they'll do all the charging. That's scientific and neat. But knives? Pah! The baggage camel had been bobbing his head to and fro for some time past, anxious to get a word in edgewise, edgeways. And then I heard him say, as he cleared his throat, nervously, I, I, I have fought a little, but... Not in that climbing way or that running way. No, now you mention it, said Billy. You don't look as though you were made for climbing or running much. Well, how was it, old hay bales? The proper way, said the camel. We all sat down. Oh, my cropper and breastplate, said the troop horse under his breath. Sat down? We sat down. A hundred of us the camel went on, in a big square. And the men piled our packs and saddles outside the square. And they fired over our backs, the men did, on all sides of the square. What sort of men? Any men that came along, said the troop horse. They teach us in riding school to lie down and let our masters fire across us, but Dick Cunliffe is the only man I'd trust to do that. It tickles my gurus, and besides, I can't see with my head on the ground. What does it matter who fires across you, said the camel? There are plenty of men and plenty of other camels close by, and a great many clouds of smoke. I am not frightened then. I sit still and wait. And yet, said Billy, you dream bad dreams and upset the camp at night. Well, well, before I lie down, not to speak of sitting down, and let a man fire across me, my heels and his head would have something to say to each other. Did you ever hear anything so awful as that? There was a long silence, and then one of the gun bullocks lifted up his big head and said, This is very foolish indeed. There is only one way of fighting. Oh, go on, said Billy. Please don't mind me. I suppose you fellows fight standing on your tails? Only one way, <coughs> said the two together. They must have been twins. This is that way. To put all 20 yoke of us to the big gun as soon as two tails trumpets. Two tails is camp slang for the elephant. What does two tails trumpet for, said the young mule? to show that he is not going any nearer to the smoke on the other side. Two Tails is a great coward. Then we tug the big gun all together. Hia, hula, hia, hula. We do not climb like cats, nor run like cats. We go across the level plain, 20 yoke of us, till we are unyoked again, and we graze while the big guns talk across the plain to some town with mud walls and pieces of the wall fall out and the dust goes up as though many cattle were coming home. Oh, and you choose that time for grazing, do you? said the young mule. That time or any other. Eating is always good. We eat till we are yoked up again and tug the gun back to where Two Tails is waiting for it. Sometimes there are big guns in the city that speak back, and some of us are killed, and then there is all the more grazing for those that are left. This is fate, nothing but fate. Nonetheless, Two Tails is a great coward. That is a proper way to fight. We are brothers from Hippur. Our father was a sacred bull of Shiva. We have spoken. Well, I've certainly learned something tonight, said the troop horse. Do you gentlemen of the screw gun battery feel inclined to eat when you are being fired at with big guns and two tails is behind you? About as much as we feel inclined to sit down and let men sprawl all over us or run into people with knives. I never heard such stuff. A mountain ledge, 
A well-balanced load? A driver you can trust to let you pick your own way? And I'm your mule? But the other things? No, said Billy with a stamp of his foot. Of course, said the troop horse. Everyone is not made in the same way. And I can quite see that your family on your father's side would fail to understand a great many things. Never you mind my family on my father's side, said Billy angrily, for every mule hates to be reminded that his father was a donkey. My father was a southern gentleman, and he could pull down and bite and kick into rags every horse he came across. Remember that, you big brown brumby. Brumby means wild horse, without any breeding. Imagine the feelings of Sunul if a car horse called her a skate. And you can imagine how the Australian house horse felt. I saw the white of his eye glitter in the dark. See here, you son of an imported Malaga jackass, he said between his teeth. I'd have you know that I'm related on my mother's side to Carbine, winner of the Melbourne Cup. And where I come from, we aren't accustomed to being ridden over roughshod by, by any parrot mouth, pig-headed mule, and a pop-gun pea-shooter battery. Are you ready? On your hind leg, squealed Billy. They both reared up, facing each other, and I was expecting a furious fight when a gurgly, rumbly voice called out of the darkness to the right. Children, what are you fighting about there? Be quiet. 